Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the East Lindsay series. This is the biggest district in Lincolnshire containing 188 civil parishes. Without further ado, here's today's offering. Welcome back to East Lindsay again, everybody. Now, the last two we've seen in this district have been, shall we say, very, very small. Well, this one's got a bit more meat to it. And you guys know how much I love a thatched cottage. Well, in this place, there are plenty of them. And I am very excited to film them because I just love how they look. They're just, they're just brilliant. You don't see many of them in Lincolnshire and you know, it's, it's a rarity. <laughs> so that's, I don't know, I'm just, I just get excited about it. This is Thimbleby. The East Lindsay series is sponsored by Gainsborough Cycles 01427 617 752. For all your cycling needs, this is your one stop shop located at 20 Ropery Road, Gainsborough, or online at gainsboroughcycles.com. There's a link in the description. Gainsborough Cycles, ask for Trevor Halstead. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like, and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Thimbleby, Thimley's Farmstead. Welcome back to East Lindsay folks, although in this episode I could so easily be introducing you to a place in America. This is Thimbleby, a small village that sits one mile to the west of Horncastle at the foot of the Lincolnshire Wolds. Its name is Danish and literally means Thimley's farmstead, Thimley being a Norse personal name. It was listed in the Doomsday Book as Stimbleby, and at that time it had 67 households, a number considered to be very large. This tiny village might be several thousand miles from America, but if you delve a little into its history, you soon discover its hugely important link to all things stateside. It's rare these days to find a village whose church is younger than its houses, but here in Thimbleby, that's exactly what you'll encounter. The centre of the village is marked by a collection of mud and stud thatched cottages, some of the most delightful buildings you will ever see. They're beautiful, but also famous. In 1607, they were the blueprint for the original houses built in the first permanent English settlement anywhere in America, located in Virginia. The cottages are the standout features of a village once again teeming with historical nuggets. The pub for one also has a fascinating backstory. Let's get walking and see how many more we can uncover. We start with a little drive into Thimbleby from Horsington. There's not much to see up this end, but I was trying to capture Thimbleby Training and Boarding Kennels, which stands at the end of this road. It has some lakes of some kind, which on the map look potentially like they could be fisheries. Nothing certain there though. Between that and the village there isn't much. It'll come as no surprise by now to learn that we're in a village dominated by farming. Behind the hedgerows you can see either side of us is some rich arable farmland, and Thimbleby has a small collection of working farms. It's been the same way for centuries. The parish was enclosed in 1779, and the large open fields divided up into smaller fields, which were more efficient for farming. Whatever the population, Thimbleby has always been a long, scattered village on a declivity of the walls, overlooking the valley of the Bane. Let's park up and see what it's like to walk through. 
We start on Mill Lane, which is the other end of the road we used last week as we left Langton. Our first landmark is Thimbleby's only pub, the Durham Ox. This fine country inn is over 200 years old and reopened after a period of closure in 2013. It has what's known as a cowshed bar and features an RAF corner inside. At the back, there's a large field for caravans and campervans. The pub is named after a huge 18th century ox. At its largest, it weighed 270 stones. It was an early example of what became the shorthorn breed of cattle. In 1801, it was sold to John Day of Harmston in North Kesteven. It was he who named it the Durham Ox, since it was born in Darlington. Here's the church. This is dedicated to St Margaret and it's a Grade 2 listed building. This was built of green stone in 1744 to replace a medieval church which stood on the same site. The original church was 14th century. It was then largely rebuilt in 1879 by who else but James Fowler of Louth. The building is in the English decorated style. Its short stone spire has been replaced recently. The original was removed on health and safety grounds. Pre-conquest, Thimbleby had no church and relied on Edlington and several other neighbouring parishes instead. Traces of a moated enclosure close by are believed to be the site of a grange. Thimbleby has expanded somewhat from this central point over the centuries. We're coming into the centre of the old village and that's where we find the old water pump. This dates from 1857 and stands in a three-sided red brick enclosure. The pump handle doesn't work anymore, but even if it did, the water would be unfit to drink. That's according to this plaque. Next, the village hall. This was built in 1857 originally as a school, and like the church, it's Grade 2 listed. The 1872 trade directory says the school was built on a site gifted by Edwin Kemp and was attended by around 40 pupils. There's the parish notice board. Tick it off, folks. Thimbleby has several ancient cottages, some mud and stud and some thatched, including the 17th century Rose Cottage. These houses were the blueprint for the very first houses built in Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. What's more, they were probably built by the same carpenter as well. English settlers arrived in Virginia on three ships, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed and the Discovery. A total of 104 English men and boys would then begin America's first permanent English settlement. Jamestown was named after James I, the reigning monarch at the time. The site for Jamestown was picked for several reasons, all of which met criteria laid out by the Virginia Company, who funded its construction. It was surrounded by water on three sides, meaning it was easily defensible against possible Spanish attacks. The water was also deep enough that the English could tie their ships at the shoreline, and it wasn't inhabited by the native population. Isn't history wonderful? When the Priestley and Dawson families moved into the village in 1843, they bought a piece of land upon which this primitive Methodist chapel was built. It opened in 1857 and closed in 1995, after which it was used for storage. Later it was converted into the house that stands here now, Eglise Cottage, Eglise of course being the French word for church. From this point on, there's a couple more thatched cottages and a few other buildings, but in general, Thimbleby starts to peter out into the Lincolnshire countryside. Okay, so when you reach the chapel, the road starts to run off back towards where we started up near the boarding kennels on the drive-in just there. And with it being a linear village, there isn't any, any way back apart from just to walk straight back down the main street uh, where we've just been. So what I'm going to do is, on the way back, I'm going to make a little montage of a few of the houses which we haven't yet seen. And uh, yeah, that will soundtrack our way back to the Durham Arks.
Okay, here we are back then at the Durham Ox. Now, there's one more thing I want to cover before we move on to the next one in this East Lindsay series that falls within these boundaries. You see, Thimbleby, it's not just about the village itself. There's a few other bits around it. And one of the things that falls within the boundaries is the Horncastle Garden Centre on the A158. Let's go there to finish. Using the car, our last job is to check out Horncastle Garden Centre on the A158. This has been trading since 1983 and remains an important business on the fringes of the historic market town. Its history goes back much further than the 1980s though. Even though this site has only been here for 40 years, the nurseries have been trading for over 200, going back through seven generations of the Crowder family. Supported by a 120 hectare nursery, many of the plants, trees and shrubs sold in the garden centre are homegrown. Horncastle Garden Centre joined the family-owned British Garden Centre Group in 2018. It offers everything you need for your garden and more, with an extensive variety of plants and equipment. Stock varies from bulbs and vegetables, plants, tools and garden furniture, lawn care, pet supplies, seeds and more. There's also a homeware and kitchenware department too, and it's dog friendly, so your pups are most welcome here. The centre also features the Gardener's Retreat Restaurant, which serves a variety of meals, treats and drinks, and even has a carvery on selected days. And that's it folks, that's been Thimbleby. After a short trip through Horncastle, I was off to the next one. Be warned, before we reach it, you might want to steer clear of corned beef. It's lethal in the next village. Thanks for watching this video folks don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already it really makes a difference with youtube if you're new here subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it you can find all the links to my social media accounts below as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel also if you've enjoyed this episode have a look at some more videos in this series until next time i've been andy also known as the village idiot and i'm out